Hey, welcome to another draft physics, draft science video presentation. I'm uh, going to watch an old style physics video. Um, they're really good, these ones from the 50s and 60s. Eh, it's too bad they're all not like archived in one place. You can actually find all of them. But anyway, um, you run across something now and then. And so I ran across this one. And it's uh, using a linear accelerator. Um, and it sort of says, you know, this is part of a series on special relativity. Like, they're trying to demonstrate something. And so I'll just point out the trying part that's just kind of obvious and provide the alternative explanation, blah, 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 and such. So uh, let's uh, go to the beginning. <laughs> Okay, so <clears throat> they're going to measure the speed of an electron uh, based on how much energy they put in to get it to move um, and point out how it doesn't go anywhere. Now the chart they're using is preposterous, okay, so it, the speed of light is the bottom line and where it says 2 and 3 and 4, that's four times the velocity of the speed of light. So they know nothing's going to go there. They know nothing does that. So they've, you know, skewed the chart to look ridiculous um, to attempt to make some sort of point that, you know, physics breaks down because of special relativity or some kind of... It's an implication, if nothing else. And it just has to do with the distortion created by how they decide to chart something. So you can chart things by having the units very disproportional and you know you can make something look almost any way you want to so this is where statistics sort of breaks down um, is in the fact that people can present it looking rather ridiculous uh, <laughs> versus the line that would have been created if they charted it in some balanced way you would have a nice line that just would be straight through the middle of the chart but instead they distorted the chart for their purposes all right, so the idea, <clears throat> let's see if we can get to another good image. I don't think we'll bother with all the superfluous <clears throat> jibber-jabber, and I'll just do that part. Um, so this is just about how they're going to measure it <clears throat> through measuring the charge as the electrons go past. Um, and they'll be able to tell what, they're, you know, what they are because they're going to excrete their charge on the environment around them. And um, so they're going to measure the charge by how much, what's excreted. If a magnet goes by, you see the north side, and then you see the south side. Um, <clears throat> and, well, frankly, they don't have any way of detecting that part of it, actually. <laughs> but anyway, um, moving on. Uh, so there's the oscilloscope, and I guess that's the important part. So they're going to measure the electrons and how fast they get from point A to point B by shooting them through a tube. And you can make a couple of different arguments about um, what your expectation should be over distance about electrons and um, you know whether they can move perpetually. Um, that is, you give them a velocity and they'll go an endless distance um, at that same velocity, and that's an open question. So this is where <clears throat> the magnitudes of these humps change for no good reason, actually. Um, you know, it's not really explained. Um, but anyway, uh, but later they won't be this deep. Uh, you know, and they will only go this deep usually when they feed two signals, two of the same signals in. Uh, but regardless, um, okay. So here's where he starts the chart. Um, so they're measuring velocity based on the distance between those two humps and um, you can see here uh, that it's charted uh, he does a little calculation this is the speed of the electron burst when the voltage across the van de Graaff well, let's just get to it per second squared at point 0.5 point 0.5 MeV this plots Here. All right. So um, the first critique I'd make is they're only plotting, you know, once you know, at um, a half a million volts, and 
they don't plot any slower speed so that would be the really interesting part is to see how slow they can make an electron move but we don't see any of that so all we're going to get is part of the curve and they're going to just going to imply the rest of the curve so this is the uh, Lorenz contraction the idea that um, you need more and more energy <coughs> to get something to move which is part of the argument so the curve goes something like this in terms of your you have a plateau of the speed you can go which is the speed of light yeah. yes that's visible um, <clears throat> so that's the fastest speed you can go and that to get there you don't have much change <coughs> at slow speeds and all the the big amount of change happens as you approach the speed of light and uh, once you get there you're done you can't no matter how much energy you put in you won't get any how much energy you put in this way um, <clears throat> you won't get anything faster out um, actually the curve should go the other way right <laughs> so their curve is exactly backwards yeah the curve should go this way um, <clears throat> so yeah that doesn't even make sense frankly well, anyway, so another thing that doesn't make sense. Ooh, what a surprise. All right, so anyway, my simple argument is, <coughs> is you know, so they're just basically arguing that you have a particle moving um, <coughs> and you push it with energy and it goes a certain speed that's uh, something less than, okay, um, as a practical matter based on the formula. You, the amount of energy you put in doesn't all go into the velocity of the object and so somehow you you know you have to you're you're losing some so you put in a certain amount and a certain amount gets lost and a certain amount does go into your object and it does actually move so there's a, a relationship between those two things and the relationship is this as this thing moves faster and faster your loss arrow gets bigger <laughs> and your gain arrow gets smaller and smaller so you're gaining less and less velocity as you're pumping in more and more energy. You just can't get any more. <coughs> it's harder and harder to get the velocity in. And this is sort of stated as some sort of Einstein speed limit. Like, you know, we'd be surprised that things can't go, that the objects can't go faster than the actual force goes, which, you know, has rational explanation. So, if you followed along so far, so I've made these simple arguments about um, how energy is just uh, something you exchange, you exchange a, a, a disposition, and so I've argued that the electron already has energy trapped in it, and it just happens that the energy is in balance. If it's staying where it is, then it's in a situation with protons and electrons, other electrons, where it doesn't go anywhere because inside the electron it's saying okay I'm balanced I got a balance inside of me so it's like having fish swimming in a school and you have an equal number of fish swimming in the dimensions you know in and out also and it just happens that you got three fish kind of pushing their bubble this way and three fish pushing the bubble this way so you could think of it as a bubble so in a way sort of theorize that electrons could be just made out of a border of dead photons, you know, photons that don't move, okay, and they're essentially creating a, a trap in the inside where energy reflects back and forth inside the bubble and um, <coughs> essentially duplicating this idea of an interior and an exterior. And so it sort of can be argued is that Yes, you can understand that this was a school of fish, or this was a school of energy, that the external world could hit the bubble, um, move it, you know, a space, and now this reflection happens sooner than it did, you know, sooner than it would have. That means this side gets pushed this way because there's going to be a little more energy going this way, and that's going to push this side of the bubble out. And that that's the nature of motion is the idea that you have a cart and you shove energy in and the direction you go in creates plus motion of the cart and then when it reflects it creates zero and then when it reflects back again it creates plus motion again 
and so that the cart just jerks its way forward. Now this is sort of illustrated in some Professor Lewin videos when they use a, a sled on a air cushion and then they tie springs to it. You can sort of see you push it this way, one, one thing that's tied with a spring and it'll keep herky-jerking its way through space. Um, so that's one way of seeing it. But the idea, I would argue, is just that you're really just making exchanges. So energy goes this way, it hits something that has a disposition, and what you're going to do is basically make an exchange. The thing, the motion this way is going to come out, motion this way is going to go in, and now your balance of fish has changed. So you gave away a fish going that way, and you gained a fish going that way, which ends up being really a uh, plus two, you can see that, yeah, um, that you've gained in this direction. So you now have more pressure pushing you in one direction than you do the other direction, and that's how you speed up. So you could understand that if this is true, that the electron is a exchange mechanism, then it would be perfectly logical to understand that once you've changed all of the arrows inside the thing, I mean, once so you're, you're hitting it with a force, you're making these exchanges, and you're taking arrows that are going this way and turning them into essentially arrows going this way. So anything not going this way, you're hitting, because obviously you can't hit something going the speed of light that way. Right? It's not going to happen. Um, and the thing, as it goes faster and faster, you could sort of understand that the, the time, so the faster I make this thing move, this physical object, this medium, you can understand that the reflections going this way, the motion going this way, takes a long time because the surface keeps moving away from the little fish, right? You can't hit the surface because the surface is moving pretty fast, so it, takes, it could take it a, a long time to go that way, but going this way, it's only doing that for a millisecond because this back surface keeps moving towards it. So as it goes back this way, the surface is moving towards it. And the, you know, the, if you're going half the speed of light, that's where it hits. It hits here. And then it bounces back this way. But because the thing's moving half the speed of light, the surface is way out here. The surface isn't right there. So it's going to spend a lot more time going this way. So the fish end up going mostly one way, you know, predominantly one way, the faster and faster you're going. So the harder it is to hit this fish. You can't hit this one because he's going the same speed the force is going. But you can hit the return. But it's only a tiny portion of the time is the return fish available to be hit. So the faster and faster you're going, the harder and harder it is to hit. And the, the point would be is that once you have a piece of matter going, you know, an electron or a proton going the speed of light, you've essentially turned it into just energy. It's just fish now all going in one direction. There is no anything else to it. It's just this stuff moving the speed of light like it might as well just be a force of some kind because it's just stuff going the speed of light and it's lost all of its identity as something that's going in any other direction or has even um, a tangibility in any other direction. I mean you obviously can't feel its mass or touch it you know going this way. You can't hit it going this way with a new fish because it's going the same speed as the fish. So that's not going to happen. So anyway, you'd understand why there's a speed limit, because the, the speed is going to be decided by what it's made of. And you change what it's made of by interacting with it. That's disappointing. Oh, I don't know what the hell that was. Were you important? <clears throat> it looks important. Well, hmm, what the hell that is? Anyway, <sighs> life in a crowded space. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so yeah, that sort of explains it. So there's no surprise there's a speed limit because the force is going the speed of light and the matter doesn't <laughs> for a kind of an obvious reason. It can't. But it can only go as fast as what it's made out of. It's made out of the same stuff, just in a different container. And um, that allows for these interactions, uh, the force to add or the force to subtract, because this has a net condition. 
and all you can do is change its net condition to all this way or all that way but you can't go faster than all that way or all this way that's the speed limit now there's rational ways to explain uh, the reason there's a speed limit you don't need special relativity jargon or absolutist statements like there's some kind of law there's no law there's just a physical fact that motion isn't something you can just you're not giving it you're just exchanging it and exchanges are a lot different than um, piling on and increasing something's mass and all of that stuff you never increase anything's mass you just increase the direction of its mass if all the fish are swimming this way you're going to say all the mass is going this way okay <laughs> i mean you know, if it's at the speed of light it's going to have almost zero mass this way and it's going to certainly have zero mass this way you're never going to see its mass that way so yeah all of its mass is going in one direction now instead of being split over these different dimensions so obviously when it hits here, you know, it hits something, you know, plows into it, when it has velocity, well, yeah, that's just because it has more mass now in that direction. It has less mass than all the others. So it's kind of just moved its mass into one dimension. And by moving its mass into one dimension, its, its whole mass now will be realized <coughs> at impact. And it'll be its whole mass and nothing more. So anyway, they sort of imply that something else happens because they use two um, they use two different ways to um, measure an outcome in the end. So I'll get to that part and explain how it's another just kind of a trick. It's not a very good. It's not um, it doesn't dem prove anything. It just indicates something because it's a little bit thin in terms of evidence. It's a <clears throat> It's sort of circumstantial versus hard evidence in a trial. Uh, but I will get to that shortly. All right, should be back. All right, so I guess we'll just do a quickie on what, how this linear accelerator works um, based on what you know they say. So you, you heat a piece of metal, essentially, um, and so it gets hot, and so it's you could argue that it's sort of degrading or falling apart because it's hot so who knows what's actually coming off of it and then you create a electrical potential um uh, decidedly let's see which way does it go if you want to push electrons so you have the negative end <laughs> you must have the negative end over there <coughs> okay so you want to push electrons so you create an electrical potential, so the electrons will want to fly this way as they're motivated by being loosened by the heat. So the heat loosens, you could argue, the little bits, and the electrical potential makes them fly. Now you could argue that if a if an atom positions itself in in uh, sympathy with that um, arrangement, that is it has its electron forward and its proton backward that it would also be shot by that potential that the magnet will move in the potential so you might be doing some atomic bits um, nuclei and whatnot but anyway for the sake of argument and so they can increase this potential for to you know 0.5 of a thousand a hundred thousand volt no million volts 0.5 of a million and then they go to a million, and they go to a million point five, and that's what these little extra dots are. So they increase the voltage, but they don't get a doubling of the speed. They get much less than a doubling um, of the speed of the electron. So they put in twice as much energy, you know, and they put, start off with this much, and then they double it, but they don't get, you know, double the, the push out of it in terms of any speed increase. So then they turn on the linear accelerator part. Okay, this is pretty much a simple accelerator, and then this linear accelerator does something else with radio frequency, and they don't explain that part. But apparently, this part creates lots of gamma rays and X rays, and all kinds of stuff pops out of this thing, this mechanism, whatever it is, because they have to have a two feet of shielding to their detector on the other side, because it's creating so much 
dangerous radiation that they have to be shielded from it when they're doing they're detecting over this other end so anyway it's just a tube that the electrons fly through and these each one of these things increases it by like four times so this is an increase over this million and a half volts well three times let's say well anyway so we end up with four million volts worth here okay now it's not really a voltage it's some other mechanism they're using to push the electrons but they're pushing them in a force all right and then at the end they're just going to they just have a little hunk of aluminum and they're going to just detect how much charge is on the aluminum um you know how 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 much of this how many of these electrons hit will increase the negative charge and obviously they can detect that charge and then they have another thing they're going to do is put a little thermocouple on it and they'll measure how hot it gets and um, you know when they're doing this extra bit so now they're going to start measuring the temperature and <clears throat> so <clears throat> what happens is is they increase it this dramatic amount you know to, to four million volts and yet the dots you know on the, the chart just is kind of leveled off and that's all it's going to do because they have a chart that's preposterous right the, the only part of the chart's relevant is that part below that line because that's the speed of light and you wouldn't have any expectation you can push it faster than the force pushing on it it's like saying you can make something go 60 miles an hour by pushing on it 20 miles an hour you know and you just keep pushing 20 a lot and somehow you can get to go 60 that ain't going to happen uh, it doesn't add up that way your force has to be faster than your motion for you to actually add force I mean, if I'm running behind something at 20 miles an hour and it's, it's, it's going, if I'm running behind it at 19 miles an hour and it's going uh, 18 miles an hour, I can't add much. Uh, you know, I can only add one tiny little mile an hour. Um, all right, so um, you can only add the difference. And you can never make the force go faster, so you can't make the object go faster. That's simple enough logic. Um, I don't know why it would be any mystery or we need Einstein to um, figure that part out. We really don't. don't need any relativity theories or any of that smush. So anyway, the important thing is, so we're going to sort of imply that although they don't get an increase in, in the velocity, so the velocity tails off and they can't get any increase in velocity, they're going to now measure the heat and say, ah, but the energy is still somehow there because this thing's going to get hotter. Okay, so when they increase with the linear accelerator, they increase the what they think is their their um, electron volts, their the the pushing force. You know, so they dramatically increased the force going in. So now when they measure it, they get the same result for the charge. It doesn't. They're not getting any more charge on the object, um, indicating any faster electrons. Um, well, they're not moving any faster. So when they time them, so they're timing how long it takes, and they don't get there any faster, not dramatically, just a tiny bit faster. Um, and the charge um, isn't increasing. It's the same number of electrons, so they can't increase the charge because their pulse always has the same amount of electrons in it, technically. But it gets hotter, okay? So, and it seems kind of obvious that, well, sure, it's going to get hotter if you're hitting it with x-rays, you know, you're hitting it with x-rays, you're hitting it with a whole bunch of other energy that you're, you're made over here to try to push. So all your pushing energy is moving the speed of light. Your object's moving almost the speed of light. So obviously you're pushing all that energy in. The energy is not going to create charge. You know, photons aren't charged, so it's not going to increase your charge number. And so the only thing that energy can do is make it hotter. So of course, you're just measuring how much energy you're pushing with. You're not measuring the actual object anymore. I mean, how much how much the electrons and protons are increasing the temperature. So um, it's sort of a bogus implication um, because all you're doing is measuring the energy you're putting into the machine to try to push. You're not measuring anything real that the uh, electrons are providing. All right. Enough said. So maybe we'll just uh, say that's enough because there's you know, nothing else to say. So this is where he's talking about the little thermocouple. Uh, so just show you. See, there's a little piece of aluminum. 
uh, obviously the little probes are measuring the charge on the aluminum and then the you know there's a thermocouple in there collisions with the aluminum atoms and most of their energy goes into heating up the aluminum so we can measure the energy in the bursts of electrons by finding out how hot the aluminum gets and we can measure the energy per electron by measuring the charge and finding out how many electrons brought in that energy right now that's never going to change their pulse is always the same so they can't make more electrons so it would be a silly expectation that somehow they're going to get more charge you don't make more charge by accelerating a charge it always has the same amount so when it lands it's just an electron you've added an electron to the atom therefore you've changed the balance in the atoms and you've got an extra electron to account for it makes you a little more negative than you were before so that's sort of again why would anybody expect otherwise here in the side of the disk we have embedded a thermocouple to measure the change in temperature of the disk these two watts see the interesting thing is 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 you know you have to say well where are they measuring the charge on the aluminum because you could argue that every metal that gets hit by photons x-rays all that kind of stuff creates a charge in the sense that there's a currents that move through it one side becomes positive one side becomes negative blah 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 so you could argue that maybe it depends on where you're where you're measuring the charge on the aluminum because the aluminum is actually becoming a dipole all right from the thermocouple go out here to the connecting leads okay well we don't need all of that detail quite obviously and such well, let's see if there's anything. Yeah, he's just doing the, the calculations. Graph at 1.5 million volts. And we'll turn on the first section of the LINAC. Uh, the LINAC is the linear accelerator thing that they don't explain how it's pushing, what it's pushing with. And so they're just showing here that the temperature goes up more, but the number of... Um, uh, the amount of electrons which are counting here uh, doesn't increase. Uh, you know, for the same number of electrons, they got more heat. Well, they got more heat because they're pushing more heat into the aluminum because they're shooting it with a bunch of x rays and other uh, artifacts. So let's just sum up. Meters per second. Now, we have by no means exhausted our energy resources here. In fact, we often use this linear accelerator in experiments with nuclear reactions, which, if they're going to occur at all, require electron beams with energies of 15 million volts. So we can readily push our experiment one step further. So again, it's this statement that um, somehow it makes any difference because the electrons really aren't doing the moving anymore. And what you're really doing is shooting a bunch of force. You're creating a beam of high energy force, uh, you know, gamma. As you recall, in our last speed measurement, where we used only this first section, the burst of electrons moved freely from this point on down the pipe with an energy of 4.5 million electron volts. Now we can turn on all these other sections of the LINAC. Then, as each of So again, he says they moved with this greater speed, but they really didn't. There was no evidence in the speed of the increase in the voltage, so they quadrupled the amount of voltage and they only you know by a two percent increase in speed so when he says that electrons move freely at this huge speed now there wasn't a huge speed electron goes from section to section it will be pushed on again and again by the electric fields generated by these power sources right so that's where we just get this the electric fields created by these power sources so who knows what the electric fields are. He's using a Venn de Graaff to start to create the electrical potential in the first section. So why are we using something different in these other sections? So there's no explanation of that. Exactly how they make these electrons, what extra force they apply. But the clear implication is whatever they're doing, it's obviously creating a lot of dangerous rays because they have to have a two-foot wall to protect them from it. As the electrons come out of the last section of the LINAC, 
each will have an energy of about 15 million electron volts. Right, so he says they have this energy. They don't have the energy. They don't, you can't make the energy any other way for an electron than to give it velocity, to take this, the fish and make them all point in the same way. That's its energy. That's its mass. And you can only make its mass point all in one direction, or you can have its mass pointing in all kinds of directions, and therefore neutralize its potential to squish things because its mass is balanced. It has as much stuff going this way as that way, therefore it won't squish you. But if it has more stuff going towards you than it has going away from you in it, then it will impact you by that proportion. And the bigger that proportion gets out of balance, the bigger trouble you're in. This is more than three times the energy of our previous measurement. So. If there is any accompanying increase of the average speed over this flight path, we should see it. And I'll jump a little ahead. What do you expect to see? The separation between the signals... So now the signals aren't going way below the line again. So again, that's a little bit weird. Why are they clearer and now they're not as clear certainly the target has gotten fuzzier and blippier for some reason um, so whatever it seems something's happening to the the electrons aren't hitting quite as well as they were hitting before it's about the same as in our 4.5 a lot more inconsistent a lot of lines going much lower and blah 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 so the pulse isn't as clean as it was before indicating somehow that the more energy you're pushing into these electrons the more electrons are scattering going flying off so you're losing probably some of your electrons i let me be run 2.9 divisions so the speed has not increased You can see that our curve has indeed leveled off since the last energy we used would be way out here. Clearly, the prediction of Newtonian mechanics does not explain this result. So, again, it's not a prediction of Newtonian mechanics that anything goes faster than the speed of light. So, that's not true. Um, and the fact that it gets hard to push things wasn't in that equation. The equation wasn't made to describe what happens to things going half the speed of light. So, of course, you know, the fact that the reality changes, the more you attempt to push something, the harder it is to push. Yeah, that's not true when you're going 30 miles an hour, but it is true when you're going faster than that. It's, and it would be true for other physical objects if we could get them to go that fast. So the only thing we can move that fast are electrons. Or protons or little bits of atoms but if we could move whole objects at those speeds then we'd understand that yes the equation isn't for all things at all times the equation isn't wrong it's just not it's too general early in this century before high-speed data of this nature were available it became evident that some improvement was needed in the theory because of other problems problems such as the relationship of Newtonian mechanics to electromagnetic phenomena. Einstein. So more mush. <laughs> so just implying that, oh yeah, we had, there was lots of problems. It really wasn't. And others looked into the question of a better relation. According to the new mechanics they developed, the relativistic mechanics, the relation between V squared and kinetic energy so, look, the only thing they did was add this Lorenz contraction, where you just make sure that the denominator keeps, the denominator of your fraction, all right, um, the part down here uh, gets bigger and bigger, okay, as you attempt to um, increase the energy. So you just do this, you know, one minus uh, the speed of light, or whatever you want to use as the, the speed, one minus your velocity. So you're just creating an inverse relationship that makes this number go up as your velocity goes up. And therefore, you'll never go any faster because you're always dividing a bigger number into a smaller, a number that's not getting bigger. For electrons, is this. All right, so he just sort of made up this part here, right? We, we know he didn't, he didn't do two-mile-an-hour electrons. He didn't do three-mile-an-hour electrons. He didn't do any of that. 
So he's just assuming. At very low speeds, this new curve and the Newtonian curve overlap as they should. At high speeds, this new curve also agrees very well with the facts we found. There is a speed limit for any object, and this limit is the speed of light. So again, this, but there's no explanation why there would be a limit. And the point is, is there'd be a limit because the force is the fastest thing. It's the smallest bit, and the matter bits are really, um, their life is dictated by the force. The force makes them go, and they can't collect a whole bunch of extra somewhere. They can't go faster than the go bits they're grabbing. Uh, if I was grabbing, even if I was grabbing from the air birds that were flying, and they were all flying in this direction, and I want to go that direction, I can't collect 800 birds and go faster in the sense that I can only go as fast as the birds are going. So, you know, if I'm in a balloon and I try to tie strings to birds going 40 miles an hour, I can't collect a million birds and then go faster than 40 miles an hour. I can't go any faster than the force is going. So, you know, this whole thing is just, we have no reason to believe that you can push something or grab birds or tie yourself to some car that's going faster than the speed of light because there isn't any such thing. All right, so enough of a video. Keep it short. I think I made the point, blah, blah, blah. There are alternative explanations than any <clears throat> freaking law. There's explanations that have something to do with some real understanding of what the interactions between force and matter really involves. And you're changing the matter. The state of the matter changes when it's moving. And it moves in a real universe in the real universe there's a real thing called motion and it's not relative it's absolute it can be relative frankly two things can go the same way at the same speed so yes they can relative to each other they can be going the same way but that doesn't mean they don't have an absolute velocity in the real universe and that's what they are attempting to imply so anyway enough of that so, till the next time and such.